I want to introduce our presenter, uh, Sam Henson, and Sam is the Regional Manager of Engineering with the Simpson Strong Tie Company. And the Simpson Company um, has a, a long, long history of uh, supporting better and safer uh, building codes and standards. And I really want to thank Sam and his company for, uh, for joining us today. Well, it's an honor to be here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you all. Uh, I was able to um, be on an assessment team that was here for a damage assessment in Tuscaloosa just a few days after the event. And so I'll share with you some of the facts and some of the information that we have there. Most of my focus after that will be on um, uh, how we can do better on making our homes more resilient to these high winds that we see in tornadoes. So we'll, I'll share with you a little bit about some uh, tornado facts, some uh, maybe to dispel some tornado myths, and uh, just look at some proper construction techniques and how to build better homes to be more resilient to these types of windstorm events that we see on a regular basis. Okay, so let me start off with a few facts. And uh, this morning, John shared with us uh, several facts and uh, I'm gonna share with you a few more. We're gonna have some statistics on uh, trends and things like that. And so some things that I pulled out of my presentation just to start off with is that trends indicate that there are over 1,200 tornadoes annually in the U.S. Between 1,200 and 2,000, this graph may be a little bit difficult to see, but we'll look at it a little bit more closely here in just a few slides. So, I mean, this is something that, that is reoccurring every year we're having multiple events uh, to the tune between 1,200 and 2,000 each year. Now, before I get to the next fact, I'm going to digress just a little bit because I'm a, I'm a sports fan. How many uh, sports fans do we have here in the room? All right, we, got, we like our good Bama football, SEC, Roll Tide, except for we're not too happy about LSU being on top, right? We want to be number one. Bama's number two in B, BCS right now. Uh, let me, let me talk about Bama and football, SEC football in just a second. I'm also a, a baseball fan. I'm currently living in Texas. As, as Dominic said, I'm uh, living in McKinney, Texas, which is just north of Dallas, about 30 miles. And I've been living there for the past seven years. I uh, was born in California. I'm a Californian by birth, but I'm a Southern by choice. So I'm never going back. I love uh, the southeastern area and um, SEC football, right? But uh, I'm also a Texas Ranger fan, and so if you think about Major League uh, Baseball, what is a good batting average? Throw, throw out a number here. What's a good batting average for Major League Baseball? 300. 300. Great, right? So American League Championship uh, last year, the MVP American League was Josh Hamilton. He had a 350 batting average, right? 35% of the time he steps up to base, he's going to hit that ball. 35% of the time. 65% right? of the time, he's not going to hit the ball, right? Wouldn't we love to have that, that kind of a batting average and we look at construction of our homes, that they can resist these types of uh, events that come through? Wouldn't we want to have something much better than 35% of the time? What, what about uh, SEC football in Bama? I mean, if they were playing 500 ball, we'd probably be pretty upset right now, right? right? We're one, we want to be undefeated. We're 7-0. They lose one game, they're out of the national championship. We always expect them to be at the national championship every year, right? We're not talking about the, the high school conferences like the Pac-12. We're talking about SEC football, right? <laughs> now, I say that tongue-in-cheek because I went to SC and Pac-12, but, uh, you, you know, I agree that undefeated, right? We want to be undefeated. We want to play in that national championship every year, right? That's the kind of uh, average that we want to have for our homes and how we build. We want to build better make them more resilient to the windstorms and events that are occurring every year. So let me look at the next tornado fact here. And uh, this is something that John touched on this morning. Uh, the numbers are slightly a little bit different. He said that 98% of the storms were EF2 or less. Um, if we look at trends and uh, the data that's on the NOAA website, 90 to 96% of tornadoes have estimated wind speeds that wood structures can resist when designed and uh, constructed properly. 90 to 96% of our homes can be uh, built to withstand the winds in a tornado event. 
Now that's often different than what you hear out there, especially after an event comes through. You know, that's an act of God, we can't build for that. Those are tornado winds, they're circular, we can't build for that. But those are myths. We can build for 90 to 96% of the windstorm events that come through in this area that we're seeing on a regular basis. The cost of construction um, for a continuous load path above the code minimum 90 mile an hour wind speed that we designed for, that prescriptive code that we're building houses for, is really not that expensive. When we're looking at the uplift load path, right, um, Alan was talking about you know, uh, the affordability and can we afford it. We have the technology to build that way, but can we afford it? When we look at, when we break it down, just looking at the uplift load path, providing the proper resistance there for the wind speeds that are coming through, uh, we can break that down and it's about 25 cents to 50 cents a square foot if you're gonna build to that EF2 rated or that EF2 uh, intensity type tornado. So if you look at a 2,000 square foot house, we're talking about $1,000. Does that seem unaffordable? So for, for my presentation, um, I'll share with you some other common myths about tornadoes. We'll look at some tornado facts. Uh, we'll look at the overall wind effects of struc uh, of, on structures. And then we'll look, we'll really hone in on that continuous load path. What can we do to build better, right? As, as Alan stated here this morning, there's over 4,000 permits and so forth. It's, it's, we're gonna start rebuilding in this area. Are we gonna build status quo? Or are we gonna build just a little bit better? What do we wanna do? What do we wanna accomplish here? What are our goals? So we'll look at what some other cities are doing, like Joplin and so forth, that have experienced some of the same things, and maybe what they're implementing, and what maybe we should be looking at as we go forward and we uh, begin to rebuild this area. So one tornado myth, and this was touched on a little bit this morning, is tornadoes only occur in Tornado Alley. Now, coming from Southern California, moving to Texas, that was one question my wife asked me, aren't we moving to an area where there's tornadoes? I'm like, no, honey, there's no tornadoes in Texas. They don't happen there. That's Oklahoma. You know, she immediately got on, Googled, where is Oklahoma and Dallas? And so, you know, when you pull up Tornado Alley, this is commonly what you think of um, as being Tornado Alley, the, the Midwestern states, Oklahoma, Kansas, maybe the north part of Texas. But in reality, this is the spread of tornadoes. This is, this is what was recorded for 2010. 47 states in the U.S. experienced tornadoes in 2010. 47 states. When we look at 2011, this is through June 21st, uh, when I downloaded this information, you can see that the spread uh, is, is maybe a little bit different than 2010. It's, it's more in, in the central area here rather than on the west coast. You can see a high number of uh, tornado events that occurred in the uh, southern states there. If we, if we think about the way we build, and we're building to a prescriptive code for residential construction, that residential code says this area is 90 mile an hour wind speed. We're not in hurricane prone regions. That's, that's LA, right? Lower Alabama, right? We're in the 90 mile an hour wind speed zone. We're building prescriptively. It tells us how to build. But we're seeing tornadoes regularly in this area that have wind speeds that are well above 90 mile an hour. And we'll look a little bit more closely at what those wind speeds are for those different uh, enhanced Fujita scale uh, ratings that uh, uh, John talked about this morning. But if this is commonly occurring in this area, why are we building to 90 mile an hour wind speeds? Tornado, another tornado myth, tornadoes only uh, are, occur infrequently, right? The generational storm was talked about. The odds of experiencing a tornado are very low. Yet when we look at the trends of tornadoes over the past uh, several years here, I mean, this is uh, from 2008 to 2010, we're seeing constantly uh, 1,200 to 2,000 tornadoes occurring throughout the area. I, I wouldn't call that infrequent. Um, I'll share with you just a little bit as well. John uh, touched on this already, the Fujita scale. This was the original scale that they measured tornado uh, damage. So they, they don't measure the wind speed. They actually assess the damage that occurs in a tornado event and then try to uh, match a wind speed to that based on the material strengths and, and the construction properties that are known. So this was the older uh, scale, the Fujita scale that John touched on. And currently, though, we're on the enhanced Fujita scale. 
and it may be a little bit difficult to read, but the operational scale listed here um, says that an EF0 is anywhere from 65 to 85 mile an hour wind speeds. EF1 is 86 to 110, and an EF2 is 111 to 135. Can we design to 135 mile an hour wind speeds? Do they do that in Florida? How many hurricanes pass through the state of Florida ever here? You know? And John also touched on this, uh, you know, when they're assessing damage and so forth, we look at the type of the structure that was uh, involved. Is it residential? Is it commercial type construction? So when we're rating the damage and then trying to assess a wind speed to that, that's the first thing that we look at. The next thing that we look at is that uh, degree of damage and then also the lower bound and upper bound that, that uh, was touched on this morning. So if it's a loss of roof covering, uh, and it's uh, possibly um, maybe well built, it's, it's not an exception. We're saying that, that maybe that wind speed is 79 miles an hour. If it's more well built, maybe we use that upper bound wind speed when we're assessing the damage there. So it's a lot more scientific when we look at the damage that's involved as we go through after an event has occurred than maybe what the Fujita scale did and what they assessed damage in the past. Part of the team that I was on, and I'll share with you a little bit later on, there was many, many engineers there that taking photos and assessing the damage look, that are well versed in wood frame construction and know the codes and so forth. And so we're looking at these things, assessing the damage as we go through and, and uh, really trying to uh, determine what those wind speeds were for this area. So here's a uh, maybe a better uh, screenshot of what the wind speeds are, the estimated wind speeds for the different uh, tornado intensities that are assigned to the damaged areas. Now re recall my first slide that 90 to 96 percent of the tornadoes uh, are EF2 or less. Right? John touched on that this morning. Uh, so anywhere from 135 and less are the wind speeds generally that we see or we experience when we see tornado events come through. Here's a, a, a graph of some damage in different areas, and it might be a little bit difficult to read this. There's some different states that are experiencing tornadoes. Starting from your left and looking over, uh, the blue bar measures the number of, of in EF rated tornadoes from EF0 to EF3, and it goes from 80% up to 100%. And so the Lower intensity uh, tornadoes, the EF3, EF2, and 0, from the left to right are the blue bars. And you can see a trend there that it's 90%, 95% of the time that's those, those uh, intensity of tornadoes. If you look at the bar chart from the right-hand side, it's the higher intensity style tornadoes, the EF4, the EF5. And it's from 0% up to 10%, and the red bar graph is those higher ratings. And only 4% of the time in these different states are those uh, higher intensity tornadoes passing through. If you put that on a, a map, this is for 2010, you can see that the, the rating of the tornadoes and where the paths were and how they're rated, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but there's a rating there showing that EF0, there were 770 tornadoes that occurred in the states uh, in 2010. 339 EF1 and 121 EF, uh, EF2. If we add all those tornadoes up, just the EF2 through the EF0 for the year of 2010, that's 96% of all the tornadoes that occurred for that year. If we look at uh, April tornadoes, right, you saw this uh, screenshot this morning earlier, right? We look at the counties that were affected. Again, for two, April of 2011, if we look at the number of uh, tornadoes that are listed there and what their EF ratings are, again, 90 to 96 percent of those tornadoes just in April are the EF2, EF1, EF0 rated tornadoes. Okay, let's look a little bit more closely at the Tuscaloosa tornado that passed through on April 27th. And so here's a uh, screenshot, and I'm, I promise not to steal a lot of the th any. <laughs> A lot of the thunder from my good friend, uh, Dr. John Vandalent. He's going to share with you a lot more about the, the damage assessment, but I do want to share with you some of the things from my perspective as I was on this assessment team. But this is the, the path 
Here's a, maybe a closer up view where you can see the scouring and uh, right through the centroid of the tornado as it passed through the area. Here you can see some interesting things here. Here's the, the centroid of the tornado as it passed through and you can see um, really a lot of devastation right there, but look a block away. The house is somewhat unscathed, right? That tells me that the wind speeds significantly drop off as you go throughout the outer bands of the tornado. So maybe you have a really high wind speed here, which it, if it turns out that that tornado is rated an EF4, that may be difficult to, uh, to, to build for. Right? It gets back to that affordability thing. But look at this just a block away. Right? Those wind speeds really die off. These are experiencing much lesser wind uh, speeds there. So can we build for, even if it's an EF rated uh, four tornado area, on the outer bands, those structures that are experiencing much lower wind speeds, do they have to be damaged as much as they are during this event? Can we strengthen them to perform better? So again, not to steal uh, too much of the thunder from uh, Dr. Vandalint, uh, I'll just share with you a couple things about our uh, assessment team that I was part of. The National Science Foundation uh, sponsored it, and we were a team of about 14 people. And uh, just a few days after the event, we went and did transects across the tornado path. So this would be a transect that the team split up into smaller groups, and we walked across the tornado path. This was the known tornado path. And then at the time that we saw visible damage, as we walked across that path, uh, we would note the damage on every structure that we walked down the street. We had GPS units on our cameras and so forth, and so then we could uh, label that information, go through the degree of damage and so forth, really try to assess the damage. And we, we walk these paths along that entire tornado uh, path. Those photos were downloaded to a map and uh, the damage was assessed and, and placed onto the map. And John, I know you just walked in, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm promising not to steal too much of your thunder, just showing a couple of slides here. Uh, and so, uh, you know, those, those photos were rated put onto the map based on our GPS units that we carried. And you can see the color coding there that's uh, basically a color coding on its damage assessment. So if it's an EF0, uh, EF1, EF2, EF3, EF4 damage rating, whatever that structure had, that color coding goes along with it. And if we look at that and we filter the damage, right, so once those photos are, are put onto this map and we filter the damage and, and, and spread that out, you can see the actual damage ratings uh, along that tornado path. Now, it's, it's been pretty commonly stated that the Tuscaloosa tornado, this one in particular, was an EF4 rated tornado. And if you look at the map here, really small portions of that tornado path are really EF4 damage. The majority of that area was experiencing that lower wind speeds, right? As the tornado goes through the terrain, is slowed down by, by the trees and so forth, maybe structures, it may slow that down, and then it picks up steam maybe when it hits a wide uh, air, open area. And so maybe if we look at this, can we add up how much area was damaged? If we look at the acreage here that was affected, we add all this up. We have uh, EF 0, 1, and 2 damage in these areas. It was 86% of the total area that was affected was EF2 or less. Even though this is an EF4 rated storm, right? Once we say it's an EF4 in one little area, we say it's an EF4 rated storm, 86% of the area was, was experiencing lower wind speeds, right? That, again, wind speeds that we can design to, right? We can build for and we can make our homes more resilient to these types of things. This is the Joplin tornado path. So we did the same thing. The, the team went out just a few weeks after the Tuscaloosa tornadoes came through. Just a few short weeks after that, the Joplin tornado passed through. They did the same exact thing. And here you can see the, the ratings uh, for EF4 were a little bit higher, um, maybe a little bit more area of that experience in EF4. Uh, but still, it's 88% of the area was EF2 or less throughout that entire tornado path. Uh, before I get to the next slide, Joplin has actually uh, instituted uh, emergency measures to their building code. They've amended their code right now uh, already, the city of Joplin has, and they're implementing uh, reinforcement to their structures. So when they go back to rebuild their homes, they want to make them stronger than what they were before. So they're not building to the 90 mile an hour wind speed code anymore in Joplin. They want to do something better there. Okay, so if we look at the range of wind speeds that we experience in a tornado, Right, the, the, 
the highest wind speeds right through the, the vortex or the center line of that tornado are going to be the worst. Right? Even in an EF2, they might be very high there. Those wind speeds will drop off just really quickly, maybe a block or, or half a block away. They'll drop off fairly quickly, the outer bands of the, uh, that the tornado will experience. And you can see the various damage that's recorded here on the map. Just a few blocks away, this home looks like it's unscathed. Let's uh, change paces here a little bit. Let's, you know, we looked at some tornado mist. We looked at some tornado facts. Let's look at the overall effects of wind on, on a home. So as the wind passes over the home, it wants to exert a force on the structure, pushes the wall in. If you have a gable in truss here, it wants to push that in. It pushes a, a shear load into the diaphragms, into the walls. But it also, as it goes over, it's much like an airplane wing. It wants to lift off the roof. We get a high uplift force there. So we have to control those things. But we can design for that. The overall effects of wind on a structure are we're going to have roof suction on our, on our roof. Right? If the wind blows over the roof, we're going to experience an, a suction force. We'll have uh, a suction on the side walls and the back walls as the uh, wind goes around that structure. It wants to pull those apart. We'll have a, a positive pressure on the windward walls. So as the wind blows, it hits that structure. It's like a fluid. It has to go somewhere. It goes around the structure, but it, it exerts a force on that structure. We're going to have some lateral loads. Some racking could occur in the structure if we don't have enough racking resistance. So those are the forces that they would experience uh, globally on the structure. When we look more closely at the building, the component and cladding issues, right? Those components and cladding would be the roof covering and the wall sheathing and things like that. How do we hold those on uh, to make sure that they stay in place. Well, we have to design for those. As the wind goes around the corners, it speeds up and it wants to pull those things off. We have to make sure that they're anchored more properly. As it goes over the roof covering, the roof decking, we want to make sure those things are held on more properly. So we anchor them down, we fasten them down better. If we don't do that, what do these elements become when they get blown off? Projectiles, right? Windborne debris, missiles. Right? which can damage structures even further. So if we anchor them uh, down better, we do a better job of anchoring them, uh, in which we really can't do prescriptively with the 90 mile an hour wind code if this is 120 mile an hour wind speeds. Right? We've got to anchor them down better. If we anchor them down better, they're not going to become uh, windborne debris and missiles and then damage the house right next to that. Right? Okay, the major overall effects of uh, wind on a structure, you're going to have wind uplift. As it flows over the roof, it's going to want to uplift that roof. You're going to have to prevent racking. As if the roof is anchored down properly, you're going to lateral load pushing on the structure. It's going to want to rack that building over if there's not adequate resistance there to the racking loads. And then once that's rigid enough, once the shear walls in place are bracing to prevent the racking, if it's not anchored down to the foundation, it could slide off the foundation. We saw some examples of that. I'm going to show you some more. These might look familiar. These are some uh, drawings from FEMA's documents and so forth for uh, continuous load path. You know, they put out really good pieces on uh, looking at continuous load path and anchoring and so forth. So when we look at a continuous load path as the wind blows over the roof, we have to start from the top down. Right? We build our houses from the bottom up, but when we design, we design from the top down. We don't, we don't know what the loads are at the bottom until we design from the top. We, gotta, we have to know what the uplift is. We have to know what the lateral load, the racking forces are on the building. And if we don't have a continuous load path there to tie it down, then we, we really can't expect that structure to withstand those things. So the, the continuous load path starts from the roof deck and goes through the roof framing to the wall framing and then down to the foundation there. So what did I observe uh, during my time in the damage assessment team in, in Tuscaloosa? Well, toenailed roof framing to wall connections. John shared with us that there was in-nailed stud to plate connections, right? We just uh, nail the plates to the studs through the end grain of the stud. We see a lot of cut nails nailing the sill plates down. Anybody know what a cut nail is? I know some of the building officials out there are well aware of cut nails. Are those uh, temporary or permanent anchorage of the sill plate? Temporary, right? It's a triangular nail. They've hammered in place. They need to go back and put permanent anchorage in if they didn't cast in place anchor bolts. Yet we all, you'll see in many of the photos here that we did not see permanent anchorage there. It was mostly cut nails. Cap block over hollow CMU stem. I'm going to show you a picture of that. Is that really a foundation or is that a veneer over a block wall that would go around our home? 
You know, should we be building on a cap block and hollow stem walls? So if we look at some of the pictures here of the, how, of the structures that uh, I observed, we see toenailing. But this is right in the code, right? If we're building the 90 mile an hour wind speeds, prescriptively, this is how we would do it. We would have maybe two or three toenails there anchoring the roof down to the walls. And this is what we would expect for a 90 mile an hour wind speed. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about building to what we are, are seeing on a regular basis with the, the wind events that come through here. Toenails aren't going to cut it. It's, it's maybe hard to believe that um, once we lose the roof, we're going to lose the walls, right? But the roof will support the walls, right? We think that the walls support the roof, but a lot of times, really, the roof supporting the walls. Once we lose, lose the roof, are the walls going to stay in place? Are they uh, stable? No, certainly not. So if we don't anchor that wall roof down properly, we're going to lose our walls and so forth, right? The continuous load path is important here. When we look at the stud, these are pictures that I took. When we look at the stud uh, nailing to the bottom plates, what strikes you as odd with that, that photo? Look at those nails. Are they bent? Right, so that means that that, that wood framing just lifted right off of those nails. Is that uh, a, a, a good continuous load path for the uplift that we're seeing from the roof? What's missing from this slab <clears throat> along the edge perimeter of the structure? Besides the structure. <laughs> what, what would obviously be missing from the edge of the slab where that sill plate used to be? A anchor bolts, right? Some kind of positive connection there anchoring that down. This might be a little bit difficult to see. I took this photo. Um, there is a cut nail there. There's no other anchorage nailing that sill plate down. That sill plate's still in place. Why do you think that sill plate's still in place? Well, because the pressure relief was the end nailing of the stud. You can see the end nails of the studs right here, right, still in place. So the studs lifted off. There was no more uplift on the sill plate, so it's not going to go anywhere now. And if we had anchored those studs down better to the bottom plate, the cut nail probably would have been the pressure relief. Right? Um, sill connections. This is... Uh, you know, I, I heard a, lo a lot of discussion this morning about, uh, you know, a majority of the homes here are, are post-World post, post -World War II. Actually, we did a lot of study, and we, uh, I think, saw the majority of the construction here was built in the, in the 70s. There is a lot of post-World War II construction, but a lot of it's also built in the 70s. However, there is new construction in Tuscaloosa, right? We're still building in Tuscaloosa. We had been building in 2009, 2010. Uh, I, I, I took this photo, we looked at the sheathing stamp of this wall that had uh, fallen over. There was a, a sheathing rating right on, the, on, the, on sh uh, right on the sheathing. Anybody know what the date stamp was? Take a guess, of this house right here. Come on, let's take a guess. 202, 2010, 2009. This home, the sheathing stamps on there was 2009. So these are built to the prescriptive code, the 90 mile an hour wind speed. Now, admittedly, this was probably an impact from some kind of a missile debris through the garage door, blew out the garage door, blew out the wall. But if that wall was anchored down properly, anchored to the roof properly, even though that missile impacted that garage door, do you think that they wouldn't have to demolish this whole house if it was still standing? Right? If we anchor it down, continuous load path, we can do better. This is a picture from Joplin uh, racking. Right? Once that building slid off its foundation, it wasn't properly uh, anchored down to the foundation, you're going to experience those racking. Right? I mean, it slid off and, and racked over and so forth. Right? But the continuous load path, racking, not just a wind uplift, but also racking forces and sliding. Here's another picture of that same job site or that subdivision that I was at where we looked at that wall that had fallen over and the sheathing stamp said 2009. This is the house right next door to it. And if we look in at the foundation there, this is a cap block over a hollow stem wall foundation. Would we expect that to be able to resist high wind uplift loads? Right? Is the cap block on top of a CMU structural? If you put a cut nail into that cap block, do we expect that? And it's just grouted to the top of the CMU? Would we expect that to, to be able to withstand loads? Walls. Right? We have a, a lot of block and brick veneer. We love our brick in the south. I love my brick on my house as well. You know, coming from California, it was a pleasant change going from a peach stucco house with a clay tile roof to a nice brick house, right? Brick veneer. But keep in mind, it's a brick veneer. It's not structural. 
when we look at these, uh, these types of structures, this was a church, we still see a lot of unreinforced masonry. Right? So here we have an unreinforced masonry wall with a brick veneer on there. That's not going to be able to withstand the high wind forces that we would experience in, in some of these uh, tornadoes. Here's a, uh, a picture of a home, and I like to ask this as I uh, show this picture. What, what year do you think this house was built? 1940? Good guess. Anybody else? It looks like it's post-World War II, right? Now, this right behind the home is the Hobby Lobby right on uh, McFarland. Anybody familiar with that? There's a gym right, at, right behind this. Right? The tornado passed, the center of the tornado passed right behind this house. This was 2010 right here. The sheeting stamps on this house, 2010. Right? This Hobby Lobby is gone. It completely destroyed. So this house was the first house in the subdivision that was experiencing a lot of high wind there. Um, but look at the front of this garage. Does the front of the garage meet the current building code standard, the uh, international residential code standard that says you have to have so much wall bracing at the front of the garage to prevent racking? Do you think that that's currently built to the standard right there, and this was 2010? Here's the inside of the structure, right? Where's the anchorage there that the IRC requires for the wall bracing at the front of the garage? We're gonna have to have 4,200 pound tie downs, right? If it, was, if it was built to the current IRC code standard, do you think the structure would have done a little bit better? So my observations from, uh, from the storm, really there wasn't any surprises in my end. I mean, I'm a structural engineer. I've been doing engineering for a long time. Been to a lot of damage assessments from tornadoes and hurricanes, as well as seismic events. The, uh, and, and I'm familiar with construction in, in, in these areas and so forth. Really not a whole lot of, of surprises there. Buildings in the central states aren't designed or are built to, to are, they're not supposed to be built to uh, withstand these higher wind forces that we're seeing from these tornadoes. Structures may not even, however, be currently built to the minimum wind speeds that, uh, that we see. I just showed you an example there at the front of the garage. They didn't have the minimum hold down requirements there. Right? They weren't in place. If we would have built to that minimum standard, would have uh, done better. There is an opportunity to build better to resist 90 to 96 percent of the tornado wind speeds. Right? I showed you several graphs. John talked about it earlier this morning there. 90 to 96 percent of the storms that pass through are wind speeds that we can design wood frame, uh, wood frame structures for. How would you like to have a, a 900 batting average? Right? We'd want better pitching at that point, right? Everybody's hitting the ball. I mean, 90 percent of the time, 96 percent of the time, we can build to resist these wind speeds that are coming through. We're going to have to change our perspective a little bit. We're going to have to get rid of that myth, that idea that we can't build to, to resist or make homes more resilient to tornadoes. Right? We can do it. So what are the rebuild construction opportunities here? What are the focused things that we have to look at? Again, I said that 90 to 96 percent of the tornadoes in the U.S. are EF2, uh, EF0. Structures can be designed for wind speeds up to 135 mile an hour wind speeds. We do it all day long in the hurricane prone region. Tornadoes with intensities of in the EF3, EF5 range have outer bands that drop down uh, within a block or two in the distance from the center. I showed you that graph, right? I showed you where those areas are. Just a block or so away, those homes are untouched. So even if it's a higher rated tornado, we can probably still build in those areas uh, to resist, um, make those homes more resilient to those wind speeds. Structures along the outer bands experience EF0 to EF2 intensity. As even in that higher rated uh, intensity tornado path, the outer bands drop down really quickly. We can build for these wind speeds. Positive connections can strengthen the structure and inc increase wind resistance on EF0 to EF2 intensity level homes. I'll, I'll show you some examples here just at the end of my presentation in a few short slides of some video of some testing to show you proof that that can be done. So areas that can be strengthened. We need to look at our roof deck to framing connection. We have to start from the top and work our way down. The roof deck needs to be positively anchored to the roof framing, first of all. Staples probably aren't going to cut it, right? They, they shoot a staple into the roof framing. Probably one leg is going to go into the roof framing. The other one's doing nothing, right? Nails are probably a better way to go there. We need to anchor those roof decks down better. We, then we need to anchor positively the roof framing down to the wall. We need to connect the wall to the studs. The end nailing of the studs to the wall gives zero capacity. The nail through an end grain of a stud 
may test out at 200 pounds of uplift load, but there's, if you calculate it through the NDS, you look at it, there's zero uplift resistance for a nail through the end grain. Especially as that wood shrinks, what happens to the hole, it gets bigger, the nail can pull out really quickly. Uh, sill to foundation connections. We have to do better there. We need to anchor those down more rigorously. Even if we did the 90 mile an hour wind speed code, it had an anchor bolt at six foot on center, we probably would have fared better there. But can we do better? What if we spaced them at four foot on center or a three foot on center, put a square plate washer on the sill plate? What would that do to our sill plate anchorage? There's some uh, uh, products there that can help with that if they miss those anchor bolts that are cast in place. But all this really comes down to the foundation. If we're building our foundation is hollow stem walls with a cap lock on it. There's no way we can expect those uplift load or the racking loads to get into that foundation properly. It needs to be grout filled, reinforced, or maybe concrete type foundations for the, all of these uplift loads and the racking forces to be resisted properly. And then barring that, once we build our homes more resilient to risk, resist these forces, on top of that, we really need to consider storm shelters for our structures. Right. They're really not expensive anymore. We can do that. You know, I, I was here at the uh, Safer Alabama Summit just a, a, a few weeks ago or a month or so ago, and uh, you know, somebody had said that you know, over 100 years ago we didn't have running water and bathrooms in our home, yet we wouldn't buy a home today and think twice about there, there better be a bathroom and running water there. Right. We need to have that mentality about storm shelters. We're in a storm hazard area, right? I showed you, we've, we know. Right? Alan said he's lived here and we've experienced tornadoes regularly. We need to start thinking about having tornado shelters in our homes to protect the occupants there. Build better homes to prevent the damage to the structure and then also have the tornado shelter there to really mitigate the, the damage and help the occupants survive these things. Here's a, a, a couple of slides that I'll share with you just before I, I, I close with the video. And this is a prescriptive wall. This is an example of a prescriptive wall built, built to the current IRC the 90 mile an hour wind speed, right? So it says anchor the roof to framing uh, connection if it's a rafter connection with, with a, a certain number of toenails, right? Table 60231 says use certain number of toenails to anchor that rafter to the top plate. It also says your ceiling joists need to be anchored to the roof rafters and then those ceiling joists need to be anchored to the, to the top plates with a couple of toenails there. When you calculate that, that might be about 150 pounds of uplift resistance. Okay, so if we look at the load path here, we have 150 pounds of uplift that is capable with toenails being dumped into that top plate. Then we walk down the load path. Well, it says take a couple of 10D nails, end nails into the studs. What's the uplift resistance of some end nails? Remember we said it was zero. What's the uplift resistance of the end nails into the bottom plate? Well, it's zero, right? So where's the load path here? Then we look at anchor bolts at six foot on center. Do you think that if we were able to get that uplift load into the bottom plate that those poor little anchor bolts could handle that, uh, all that uplift load at that spacing with just a round cut washer if we put that in place? Right, so we, we have to strengthen this wall here to be able to resist these forces. When we look at strengthening it just for 110 mile an hour wind speed, this is more indicative of closer to uh, the coastline, right? Lower Alabama, LA. You know, we're gonna have these 110, 120 mile an hour wind speeds that we have to design for. Well, we can put connections on there to strengthen that, right? Forget about the roof, the toenails there. They're gonna cap out 150 pounds. What can we do to strengthen that? We have connections from the roof framing to the wall, connections from the stud to the uh, top plates, from the stud to the bottom plates. Let's space our anchors closer together here. I'm suggesting three foot on center for 110 mile an hour wind speeds for common residential structures with a square plate washer because a round washer isn't gonna cut it especially when they over drill that sill plate, right? They put a half inch anchor bolt in there, but they over drill the sill plate around washers that's gonna pull right through that, right? We have to have square plate washers there to do that. We can strengthen this, this structure to withstand 110 mile wind speeds for 25 cents a square foot. Does that seem unaffordable? When we look at the 130 mile an hour wind speed, right, we bump up to maybe the higher coast uh, uh, wind speeds for tornado or hurricane wind speeds, right? These are the types of uh, wall assemblies that you would see, uh, even further strengthened roof to wall connections and stud to plate connections, anchor bolt spacing even closer here, and this one it's 22 inches on center for the 130 mile an hour wind speed with a square plate washer. 50 cents a square foot to build this way. This is material and labor. I'm not just talking about product here, material and labor to install this product. 2,000 square foot home, we're talking about $1,000.
Now, I realize that I'm not showing the racking forces and what's required here for racking. I'm talking about uplift only, but does that seem unaffordable to build that way? Should we really be looking at this type of a structure rather than the 90 mile an hour wind speed structure when we have 1,200 to 2,000 tornadoes passing through the area every year? But don't forget about the weakest link, right? From the roof deck, as we follow that, that uh, continuous load path, we don't want that to be the weakest link, right? The roof deck needs to be fastened down more rigorously. We need to have better fasteners there. Uh, probably staples aren't going to cut it. If we don't, the roof decking becomes windborne debris, but also in a windstorm, we usually have a lot of water. We have water intrusion into the structure, right? We want to anchor that roof decking down properly. And then just follow that continuous load path all the way down, all the way down to the foundation and make sure that foundation can handle those things. Now, does this, does this all work? Is this a bunch of engineering hokey pokey? Am I just trying up here as Simpson Trunks high to get you guys to realize that connectors are better, you know? I'm a structural engineer. I'm not just, I don't just work for Simpson Strong Tie. Does this stuff work? Well, the Institute for Business Home and Safety, and maybe more clearly, the Insurance Institute for Business Home and Safety, uh, they built a, uh, a test lab in South Carolina. Has anybody been to that test facility? We have a few. I was able to go there uh, with Dr. Reinhold uh, and, and see several tests. And so this uh, test lab was built there and the insurance industry, may, may, many of you may not know this, but the insurance industry right now is currently the largest purchaser of roof covering. Well, let me say that one more time. <laughs> the insurance industry is the largest single purchaser of roof covering, right? The roof shingles and so forth. They're trying to mitigate their costs and so forth and, and reduce their uh, exposure to that. And so they're trying to see how can we strengthen our roof covering on our homes and, and, and really reduce the cost that the insurance companies are experiencing after a wind event comes through. So they built this test lab that has uh, all these turbines on here so that we can see the uh, actual wind forces that occur on the structure, all these wind turbines, there's over 105 wind turbines there that can blow high wind speeds on a structure. They can build a full scale structure inside there. I'll show you this video in just a second. They've uncovered some really amazing things though. They started out looking at roof covering. How can we reduce our exposure there? And you'll see from this, some of these videos what they've uncovered. So l let me just share with you this video. Right now, they're going to explain that they're going to put side by side a fortified structure, which is code plus 20 mile an hour. So they're saying instead of 90 mile an hour, let's build to 110, 20 mile an hour over the current uh, code minimum wind speed uh, and just fortify it a little bit and see how it fares. And if we blow the, the actual wind on the structure that it should experience, 100 mile an hour wind speed, 90 mile an hour wind speed that we build to, how do these two houses fare? So let me just share with you for this video what they did real quick. One of the reasons we're very excited about the new IBHS Research Center is that it gives us the ability to really clearly and compellingly demonstrate different principles of superior construction. One of the things that we did first was to look at the difference between a conventionally constructed home and one built to our fortified for safer living standards that applies to new residential construction. We chose two houses based on an actual house in the middle part of the country where it would be subject to thunderstorms and tornadoes and other types of high winds and winter weather, severe winter weather. And we took two copies of that house and put them side by side in the lab and subjected them to winds of about 100 miles an hour. One of the houses was built to conventional Midwestern construction standards and one was fortified. The difference was neither costly nor all that complicated, but it makes a huge difference in that structure's ability to protect the people and the contents that reside in that house. These modifications don't cost a lot of money and they are the following. Number one, the fortified house has high wind rated shingles, roof cover, and siding material. In addition to that, the fortified house has straps that tie the roof to the second floor walls, the walls on the second floor to the walls of the first floor, and the walls of the first floor to the foundation. Those straps are very important to hold the structure together. In addition, the front door on the fortified house opens outward instead of inward. It's the same door, it's just mounted differently so that it swings out as opposed to in toward the interior of the house. The fortified house also has 8D ring shank nails instead of staples. It's very important to hold on the roof uh, covering and the siding. In addition to that, there's a secondary water barrier on the fortified home's roof, 
and the fortified home's roof has 5 8 inch plywood roof decking instead of 1 half inch roof decking. Other than that, they are virtually the same houses. Okay, so both of those homes that were built, there's a construction cost to build those. There were 1,300 square foot homes. The uh, one that was built to the uh, current standards, the IRC, um, they said Midwest Construction, they built it to the Illinois Building Code. It cost $25,000 to build that test sample. And then of the reinforced, the fortified structure where they had, it had increased uh, roof sheathing, the roof covering, the uh, connectors, the, the better siding and so forth, what do you think the increased cost was of that, of that structure, of everything? It went from 25000 to what? What do you think it went to? What was that? Twenty-seven, close. It was thirty thousand dollars. We're talking five thousand dollars to build that structure, uh, for those additional things that they described in that video. Of that five thousand dollars, the clips that they showed in there, that uplift continuous load path that I just walked you through, and you saw the video, the clips that were there. How much of that five thousand dollars do you think was uh, the clips? Take a guess, dollar wise. Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Let's look at the next video here. This is a video clip of those two homes of wind blowing of about 100 miles an hour, it's actually 96 miles an hour. The home on the left is the IRC prescriptive. I'm not complaining about the IRC by any means. I'm just saying it's built to 90 mile an hour wind speed. We're not expecting it to be built to the 120 mile an hour wind speed, right? So this is a prescriptive code. On the right-hand side is their fortified structure where they fortified those things. Now also one thing I'll share with you before I show the video is this is a trust roof. So in the IRC and in, uh, in section 802.11 it says that you, if you have a trust roof you have to have a 175 pound tie down connector. It's not uh, uh, toenails, right? But that's the extent of the load path there. Now, they were not expecting that damage. This is the next video, or the next shot of that video. They were not expecting that damage, that roof to come off that way. They have a sprinkler system for fire uh, issues right above that. And this roof, when it blew off, it went and damaged all their sprinkler system. It cost them several thousand dollars to repair that, that sprinkler system. Here in the video, though, you can see as that roof uh, came off, right, the top plates went right along for the ride. They're, they're gone, right? It, it pulled off uh, many of the top plates there, went right along with the roof. We've got to think about continuous low path for these higher wind uplifts. We can't just tie the roof into the wall uh, when you go above the 90 mile an hour wind speed and, make, and expect it to just stop right there, right? Continuous load path, it's important. If we look at the next video, um, well, I'll, I'll play it. That's 96 mile an hour wind speed. Would, if we build in the 90 mile an hour wind co code, would we expect our home to be able to handle 96 miles an hour? <laughs> what does that home become right now that it's all collapsed right there? What does that material become? Again, windborne debris, right? If we don't anchor it down, if we don't do things in place to strengthen that structure, is it gonna stay in place? But for just a few a little bit of an increase. Look at the fortified structure there. Now, one, one final thing I'll point out before I close is that on the uh, home that was prescriptively built, right, they said that the door was uh, changed on the fortified. They had it opening out instead of in. You'll see that the door, when this video uh, was shown, it, it popped open, and then when it popped open, the wind blew inside the house, and it blew the, from the, the house from the inside out, kind of blew it out, and then it, it all collapsed. However, on the fortified structure, they knew that was going to happen. They anchored the door open. They actually blocked it open when they ran that test the whole time. Yet with that little bit of fortified uh, to that structure, right, the things that, that were added to that, it was able to withstand those wind speeds. Can we build better? Can we do better? Is it really going to be costly? 
Thank you.